Hello, everybody. Let's see if I can get everything going right. So this is uh, this is one of my first official official streams. So thank you everyone for coming. I see a whole lot of people here. <laughs> this is awesome. All right. So uh, yeah, welcome to the first stream. Uh, I'll be streaming this on three different platforms right now. Some of you are watching, or I think most of you are watching on YouTube. Yeah, most of you are on the Professional Genealogist Reacts channel. I have a few on Facebook and then nobody on Twitch. But if you are on Twitch uh, or Facebook or YouTube and you're watching on another one, be sure to go to my other platforms. Follow me there as well. So hi, everybody. Um, just to go through some people that have already said hello, goaded. Gontran, evening Daniel, friend of the friend of the channel, um, and then Alexandra, hello from Germany. Karma, hello from Nebraska. Hello, Stephen from the Stephen Millsap Show. Thank you very much, Drea. Glad you could catch it as well. Hello, Matt, <laughs> and of course, enable disabled. The hello from her. Oh, Mrs. Beat is here. Hello, Shannon. How are you doing? And then uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. A virtual C. Welcome. And chaotic pixie. Hello. Oh, and there we go. Patsy's tarot musings. Hello. And then I have so many. Well, I should probably, I'm, you know, hello to everybody. Uh, but I'm, I guess I'm not going to spend the whole time saying hello to everyone. But yeah, so today I'm going to be going through some different questions, uh, a lot of it being through my subreddit. I, anyone who's been watching for a while uh, knows that I've been answering a lot of questions from my subreddit, but it's been slowly stacking up more and more and more. So I've been wanting to do a live stream just like this, just to be able to do a whole bunch at once. And you know, I feel like every video I have to kind of go through the same thing I say in previous videos, just because I never know who else is watching that just isn't familiar. So I never want to assume that everybody knows uh, what I know. So yeah. All right. I actually, before we get started completely, I've got to make sure I have my uh, moderator set up. Um, so Charlie, you're going to be one. You already know that. And then just because I can trust Mrs. B, <laughs> you're, you're a moderator too, just to help me out. <laughs> so, all right. So, yeah. Oh, good question. I am going to be starting reactions to relative race again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the first seasons. I think I'm not going to start with season one because I don't know if it's even available but I'll start with season two, go through the ones that I go through them until I get up to the ones that I have already recorded and then restart with all of the recent stuff. So uh, for anyone who's been watching the newest season that's been going on, I think the final episode is this Sunday, episode 10. So, oh, Patsy, you found uh, an NPE. Yeah, not not fun. Um especially if it's a difficult one to really figure out. Cause I know that, you know, when it's a head scratcher, it can be take a long time and you're just wanting that answer so badly, so badly. So um, hopefully everyone can, uh, <laughs> if, if anything's going on, that's weird with audio or anything, let me know because this is really my first official official stream. So I'm hoping that, you know, everything will be uh, correct. I've done a couple of testers. So, you know, Fingers crossed. Um, all right. So let's let's get into the the nitty gritty. So for anyone who's not familiar, this is the subreddit. And what I usually do when I go on to do my videos, I'll go on and click new. So it starts with the newest. And I'll go all the way down until I can find the last place that like all of these that are reviewed, those are ones that I have reviewed. But I try to get to all of the oldest ones so you can see how all of these are reviewed. So this is kind of where I last left it. And I kind of, I've started to skip a few. Some I've noticed people will post 
like multiple times at once. So audio is great. Wonderful to hear. Um, I've done well with my tree, but I'm not 100% with finding out my grandpa's bio parents. He was adopted. I do have a DNA test. Will you take a client and how much? So I'm considering taking clients. Um, I have to figure out how much I would charge for that. Uh, I've done private clients in the past and the way it works is that it'll be kind of a project sort of thing. So, you know, I'll say a certain amount of hours that are required minimum and then a certain amount per hour. I don't know if I'm going to be doing that just yet. I might be, but what I have already started doing is if you go to my Patreon, uh, I have two options where you can do a Patreon tier, which includes a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one session with me per month that you pay for Patreon. And then another that is an hour long. So if anyone does kind of just want to, you know, see what I have to say and dive really deep, because, you know, I'll be, people can, you know, on the stream today, you can uh, ask questions and anyone that does any of the super chats or anything like that, you know, those will get priority in answering questions. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to be doing super deep dives, you know, I'll probably be doing 10, 15 minutes per question. But if you want me to do, you know, a half hour or an hour one-on-one -on -one with you, uh, go to my Patreon and then do that. There's only a limited amount. And then once you sign up, I'll get in touch and we'll set one up. So, all right. So let's actually look at the questions. Um, all right. So we'll start here. Why am I picking up so much Balkan and Greek South Italian DNA? I have no known ancestors from here. And then we do have some questions. These are my family tree DNA results. Okay. So these are my results. Cut a long story short, my family tree has been done to around the 1400s at least. But the question when I always see someone post that is on how many lines? Because people will say that and then it's just one line that's to the 1400s. And then they have like, you know, a bunch of second great grandparents they don't know about. Granted, I don't know if that's the case, but Continuing, I have no known ancestors from the Balkans, Hungary, or Greece, Southern Italy. My father's side does have a lot of German ancestry. I've confirmed my cousin matches that I match the right people who I should match on these sides of my family tree. My sister matches more with my father's maternal German side. I match more with the paternal side. The paternal side was Bavarian. My Bavarian family matches do have Germanic Europe in their DNA. I seem to have missed all of this. Although, if these are your results and you kind of look, what is that big bubble? All right. Um, so my question, am I matching DNA from further afield, like a throwback? Actually, hold on. Let me see. Do they have the percentages? Yeah, they do. So, yeah, it's just it's, it's being lumped in with Europe West for the German. All right. Am I matching DNA from further afield like a throwback? I take after my granddad, and he took after his Bavarian side. We are all of skin, brown eyes. As a kid, I had blonde hair that has now turned brown. Now, I always like to say when anyone sort of mentions looks, um, that's one of those things that, you know, you can't really rely on completely. It can certainly give you a, a decent hint of things. But um, let's see. I'm actually, I'm trying to make it fit so I can read the comments while I do this too. Um, all right. So am I matching? So let me reread. I've confirmed my cousin matches that I match the right people who I should match my sister. Balkans, Hungary, Greece. Okay, well, for one, I mean, Balkans, Hungary, and Greece, if they're not quite sure about that, just looking at the map, I mean, it's right, right near Germany. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of correlation there. Let's see. Is it possible that I have Hungarian ancestry that doesn't marry up with my family tree? My sister also picks up Magyar DNA on family tree DNA. My daughter does too. Could this be why? Could this account for the Greek, Southern Italian, and Balkan DNA, even perhaps my sister's Middle Eastern? And... I, yeah, I mean, it's there's it, it's certainly possibilities. And I think I said this in the last video where it's like, you know, a lot of these admixture questions when it comes down to, you know, what's going on, 
it, it, it's just, you know, you got to look at the tree and then the records and connecting with your cousins, that's what's going to confirm the tree. And when you confirm the tree, that kind of confirms the story, or at least where they were. Whereas with this admixture stuff, you can kind of just guess all day and it'll help you in leading the research. But I, I think I, I got a little frustrated with this in my <laughs> video. Uh, people don't understand geography, empires, and movement. Yeah, that's true. I think a big part of it is, is that people don't think too deeply about it as well. Because when I do watch a lot of reactions where they are thinking about it, just a, a little bit more context with geography, movement, empires, and all of that, that they do seem to kind of, you know, get an idea of like, yeah, this is what's going on. So like my NFK, my no fuckers reaction, NFKRZ, uh, I actually am going to be doing a reaction to his newest DNA for anyone wondering, but on his first reaction that he did, he was getting a good idea of it. And he was like, yeah, it's saying this, but that makes sense because I know the connections of the different population groups from here and there. And that's really what it comes down to with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, there is a lot of back and forth with Hungary and Austria. And I mean, you know, Austria, Austria. I mean, just think Austria, Austro-Hungarian empire, it's kind of right there in the name. Um, Yeah, yeah. If you once again for anyone who's just joining the the stream, which I think, wow, I'm up to 52 people watching for my first official stream. That's awesome. Um, yeah, if you want one on one help from me, go to my Patreon, and I, I have a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm doing with Patreon. I'm actually going to also be doing um, special patron only live streams, and that will be for anybody who's doing the two dollar tier and up. So I don't know how many I'll be doing a month, but that'll be a great way to be able to ask me questions kind of like this. So it won't be super in depth, but you won't have so many people that you might be competing with to get your questions. Um, hello from Ireland. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very much agree. Don't forget to give this a like, uh, no matter where you're at. Uh, um, all right, so back to the question. Is this just genetic drift or have a common ancestry in history? And I've randomly picked up the DNA from much more distant ancestors from Southern Europe, maybe even Romans. That is certainly one of the possibilities. It could have to do with the ancestry and the connections. There is also the possibility that it's just a misread. So let's see, what how, how much were you getting for... The southern year. So the Italy, Greece is 5%, which is kind of, a, uh, it's on the higher end of a trace result. Some people would probably say it's not really a trace result. It would actually be the equivalent, and I actually had this set up. I'm so happy I had this set up. If I can get going. It is the equivalent of about a second great grandparent. So one of the things I do in a lot of the videos is I always say, What's that percentage that we're going to expect from your ancestors? Well, this is the percentage. So I've got this ticker going. So, <laughs> so there, that should, that should be helpful. But with 5%, we're probably sitting somewhere between second great grandparents and third great grandparents for this Italian, assuming that it is from one ancestor and assuming that it's true. Well, so I guess both of those are kind of the same assumption, but assuming that it's true and assuming that it's coming from one common, one recent ancestor. So this could technically be multiple different distant, re, uh, not distant reasons, but multiple more distant ancestors in different lines of the family, or it could be the history of things. It could be an issue of a misread in the DNA there's a lot of possibilities with it. And that's kind of where the, the difficulty with the admixtures comes in really is that difficulty of deciphering between one, is it true? Two, if it is true, how many ancestors, how recent or, you know, that sort of thing. And then the other question is, is there some sort of other issue going on with their algorithm in misreading it? So a lot, lot of different stuff with that one. Um, see what else they show okay so there's ancestry dna 
I just realized I'm not looking at the full images. Okay. So ancestry DNA, basically just a typical Northwestern European. What is it? That doesn't, does that add up to a hundred percent though? What is that? 68, 77. Okay. That is a hundred percent. All right. Um, and then let's see. Oh, you, you all can't see when I do the full screen. Uh, that's lame. It doesn't let, <laughs> I know how I could do it, but it's, it, you're not missing much. <laughs> you're not missing much. Okay. So yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm done with this question. So we're going to close that. Let's change the tag on here. Oh, there we go. Like I was totally missing where <laughs> where the review button was. All right. Oh, some more hellos. Andrew Martin coming in. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Cora, my cousin from Amsterdam, who I actually just met this summer. Thank you for joining from Facebook. Frank, just subscribing to the Reaction Channel. Thank you. And for anyone else who hasn't subscribed, please be sure to subscribe. And then we got a question from Frank. How often did your DNA research didn't how often did your DNA research didn't match as your paper trail? How often did my DNA research not match my paper trail? I think is the question that you're asking. Um, which for my family tree, basically what uh NPEs do I have in my family tree? And I I, I haven't found any in my direct ancestry. The closest has been cousins where basically there were cousins that I matched who had no idea about any Jewish ancestry and they would have, you know, like 6% or 12% or things like that. And then I would help figure out how they connected into my family tree. That probably happened about five or six different times on, you know, different various branches. And I think that's kind of about it. So that's technically the only ones, but it wasn't, I, it's not like I've found anything where I looked at the paper trail and then I did DNA and the DNA disproved what I had in the paper trail. So thank you very much, Chompers. I truly appreciate that. It's actually been quite, quite amazing. Uh, all the support that I've been getting ever since I uh, released my video about quitting my job, which I was kind of nervous about, you know, I did get some people that had negative reactions, but I was just kind of nervous, like, you know, hopefully it, it goes over well. All right. That, well, let's see. This may be a deep cut, but any thoughts on the effects of ancestry timber on distant matches when working on difficult cases? This is the kind of deep cut I like. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, Ancestry Timber, uh, what I think is sometimes referred to as a timber algorithm, it's this thing that Ancestry DNA uses, which goes through the DNA and basically kind of cuts out, I'm trying to think of the best term to use for it. Um, I, always, I always like to use the terminology that Blaine Bettinger uses, and I always forget it. Um, but it basically kind of just cuts out extra segments. Um, I, they're not exactly, I don't think they're pileup region segments necessarily, but it just cuts out DNA that it it figures out as some sort of not quite as positive. Maybe, maybe the best way to say is they cut out a lot of low confident segments. And so what happens with that is that, or I guess actually what the wording is, is they don't cut it out, they downgrade the segments. So what happens is, is that what you would get as a raw score before the timber algorithm is going to be more, which I think Ancestry shows you that. Um, I'd pull up my Ancestry to show that, except I have too much private stuff on there that I can't have on a live stream. But in ter terms of cutting out distant matches when working on difficult cases, I think it, it, it certainly can it's kind of one of those things where it's hard to know, you know, what you're missing out on when it's technically not there, because what happens is, is the timber algorithm will 
downgrade the amount of DNA you're sharing with matches that are very distant to the point that the shared amount of DNA is below the threshold that Ancestry sets to show up as a match. So there's a lot of matches that technically you have that you aren't seeing because they're far below the threshold of what's being set on all of the different sites. So for Ancestry, the Timber algorithm can cut that down. And I imagine it may be more diff it, it may be more of an issue for cases where you don't have that many matches, especially on the Ancestry. I feel like so many people get thousands of matches. Um, but if if you're only getting a couple of hundred matches, then those distant matches could be a big difference because when you're doing a case in DNA and using your matches, what you're going to want to do is figure out a way to cluster those matches together. And clustering is basically just taking the matches you have in your DNA match list and then figuring out which ones are coming from the same branches of your family. So, all right, let's see what else everyone said. <laughs> Glad to hear it didn't start earlier than uh, 5 a.m. Yeah, I, I have a lot of cousins in Australia and New Zealand, and I always worry about it. I actually, yeah, it, it, it's hard working with uh, having people all around the world, but got to do what I got to do. I'll, I'll be doing streams at all sorts of different times um, as well. Uh, my heritage is showing that I have 1% Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, misreader trace, last update, it's still there. <laughs> Um, I mean, it is a trace result because it is so low, but I don't know if it's necessarily a misread. You'll need to look further. If it's staying through updates, that gives you a bit more confidence. And that's really what a trace result means. It just means very low confidence that it's a true result. So if you're getting a bit higher confidence, the best way to figure it out is to look through your matches and see, are you getting matches that a lot of them have Jewish ancestry, especially many matches that have a large majority, if not almost 100% of Jewish ancestry. So in my recent video about DNA test um, tools I'd like to see, one of the things I said was being able to search through matches by not just their admixture, like what certain admixtures, like searching for people that matches Ashkenazi Jewish, but also certain percentages. So saying, you know, I want to only see people that are 75% Ashkenazi Jewish or higher. So you can see, are you matching a lot of those? Because if you are, then yeah, that might be true. Um, hello from Amsterdam. All right. I probably shouldn't be answering too many questions here. I need to get through some of the questions in the, uh, in the subreddit. So um, let's see, I'll, I'll answer this one. Why do people fully capitalize last names to denote direct ancestors? It seems so easy that other relatives could accidentally get capitalized. It seems easier to capitalize first names. I feel like this is more of an old school genealogy thing, dealing with stuff off of the internet, especially printed stuff, where the main idea is, is capitalizing using last names, which I, I, I've never necessarily seen it as direct ancestor only, but I've seen a lot of people where they capitalize the last name so that they can distinguish it. So especially in cases like in my family where there's a double surname. So my mom, is, my mom's family is Nunes Vaz. It's two names, N-U-N-E-S space Vaz, V-A-Z. Some cousins have put a hyphen in between. Some have dropped the Vaz. Some have dropped the Nunes, but if you put it in a print, then some people might be confused. And this happens a lot where like for Nunes Vaz, Nunes becomes a middle name. Vaz is a last name, which is not the case. All right. So let's get to more questions. Um, I've looked at those. I want to see if I, one of the things that I do is I upvote ones that when I see it, I want to answer it. So let me go and do some of those. Maybe this, yeah, it doesn't look like I answered this one. All right. What is better for the own genealogical research to activate another person's kit oneself or to let him make his own account? Hi, all. I'm going to buy my heritage test for my cousin. Wow, this is two years old. I really needed to get on this stuff. March 30th, 2022. Wow. All right. 
and I just wanted to ask what is more effective for my genealogical research. He just wants, he just makes the test, but I activate the kit on my own profile or he makes an account on his own note. I want to see all his DNA matches since we share half of our ancestors is if I activate his kit, he has to send me the code. Now with my heritage, I know that there is a way to have it where you buy the kit, send it to them, have them test and it's activated on your account it's been a while since i've done it and i know i was actually having a, an issue with uh trying to get one of the recent youtubers for my series uh i was having trouble getting theirs onto my heritage like something was screwing up um but i think that's what that's what i do i've i have a whole bunch of dna kits that i manage under my heritage so i'm sure there's a way uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What Brian said as well, if you have a paid account, because if you have a paid account, you get access to all the stuff, which you need. Whereas if your cousin does it, which I do also know there are some people that have kind of, I think when they've had a relative test on my heritage and they want to get access to this stuff and the cousin doesn't want to let them, log into their account for whatever reason um or you actually want to have it accessed on yours you can get the raw file and then upload it i think my heritage might kick duplicate profiles sometimes but i'm not 100 percent sure because i think i've seen multiple duplicate profiles um yeah so right that one is done That'd be one that'd be good for a video, honestly, because I, I need to show the actual MyHeritage stuff and go through it myself just to kind of make sure I know it. But, right. Okay, yeah, I, I know I've seen duplicates because when I was doing search angel work, the, one, of the, one of the unfortunate things that some people that are getting search angels do is that they'll get multiple search angels and not tell the other search angels about the other search search angels it's like they're cheating on the search angels it, it was actually i remember the first time it ever happened to me it was kind of a little disappointing i kind of get it because they're basically they're looking anywhere and everywhere they they can and so they'll find a search angel and then go post on some facebook group about something and then someone will say i'll help you and then they get that person helping too um which you know i guess it is what it is it's their their search but um that was one of the things that happened was I was doing one, uh, one of the DNA, um, one of the search angel cases. And then all of a sudden they popped up as their own match. And I messaged the person like, Hey, did you know what's going on? And they're like, Oh yeah. I asked this other person to upload it too. Yeah. I think ancestry honestly has the, best management option and sharing option for DNA tests. It's, it's a shame nobody else has anything like that. Um, yeah, Family Tree DNA, 23andMe. My heritage is a little bit in between, but Ancestry is just so much better. Then GEDmatch technically is just super easy. You just need the number, the kit number. Anyone you can talk about as far as who's coming up on your YouTuber series as in who's in the pipeline? Um, yes. So the next episode, which I'm trying to work really hard on, I actually just met with a, well, just met a few months ago. I met with a professor from BYU uh, to talk about this ancestry. Um, it's going to be for Drew Durnell. So I'll be doing an episode on him. I, honestly, I'll be also doing a lot of episodes on previous guests. So like I have one for Joe uh, Hall Patton, cynical historian. I actually have a lot of episodes already lined up for him. Um, I just have to actually get them done. But then Steve Heimler, obviously, is going to have more. Jabari Walker, I have more on the way. Um, and then some others that are in the list that I haven't done videos on. Cynthia Reyes, who is a Spanish-speaking... Uh, science channel um she's from mexico and i've been doing her uh family tree i still it it is very difficult there are records on it though um so it's been yeah i don't want to give too much away but that one 
it will eventually happen. That one's just been very difficult research. And I'm trying to think if there's anyone. Um, Canubis had mentioned that that they wanted to be a part of the series, but I've been waiting for them to get back to me about it, and I think they've been busy. So, yeah. So yeah, there, there, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of a preview of what's coming up. Um, all right, trying to read through all of the all of the. <laughs> Different stuff. Yep. Yay, Mrs. Beat. <laughs> um, I did actually message. Uh, I, I did actually message Geography now, and I don't think I ever heard back. I did a reaction to his DNA test. I think um, a lot of people probably saw that. Um, okay, let's see. We have a super chat. Alexandra, what are your ideas to solve a brick wall with endogamy? My family comes from the Dominican Republic, and we do not have census records there. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Um, as for overcoming endogamy, it is very tough, and it's even harder when you're dealing with places where the records are just not there. Now, I, I, I feel like I've done research in not – in the Dominican Republic, but I've researched families that connect to the Dominican Republic, and I, I feel like that there wasn't a lot available. I can't remember for sure. Um, but in terms of overcoming the issues of endogamy, there are a few things that you could possibly do. I'd have to see the match list to really get a good idea of how strong you'd have to do these things. But basically, you want to focus on your segments and the segment sizes of things. So those sizes will vary because with Dominican Republic endogamy, I don't know how, you know, if it's really, really hardcore endogamy with much more recent pedigree collapse and a lot of double relatives, or if it's kind of much more of a distant thing and not quite as, not quite of a, as strong of an endogamous thing, kind of like what I like to think of with a lot of the, uh, colonial American settlements. Like a lot of times you'll find that a lot of people that descend from those families will end up descending from a lot of those same families. Not quite. Ex so it's like a really almost endogamy light is what I like to think of it. But with endogamy, what you can do is focusing on the segments in two ways. One is focus on how much, um, what the average segment size is for your match. So what that means is, is Take your total amount of shared centimorgans and divide it by the number of segments you have. And if that number is below the threshold that you figure out, then that's one you want to put further away. And then ones that are higher above, you want to focus on. So as an example, with Jewish endogamy, we often see a lot of matches that will be maybe around, sometimes around the 200 centimorgan mark as the high end but you'll get tons for anyone who's jewish they'll get tons and tons of matches around 150 centimorgans and below all the way down to like 50 centimorgans and well, obviously even further and so to figure out which matches are the better matches to look at if they find matches that have an average segment size of 10 centimorgans or higher those matches are better to look at so as an example if i found a match that was 80 centimorgans across four segments. That's 20 centimorgan average segment sizes, and that's a great match. Definitely want to look at that match, but it's only an 80 centimorgan match. On the flip side, let's say I have a 150 centimorgan match, so almost twice the amount of DNA, but this one's across 20 segments. So that's going to be well below a 10 centimorgan segment average. So I'd actually prefer looking into the 80 centimorgan match over the 150 centimorgan match just because the average segment size puts my confidence much higher that it's a true match and not an endogamous match. Uh, so hopefully that that's helpful. Um, it's just with the Dominican Republic, you're going to have to figure out, is it a 10 centimorgan average? Is it a 15 centimorgan average? Um, like I've done a few Creole cases uh, and that you have to use 20 centimorgan averages because that's a very endogamous population that came from an already endogamous population. 
So basically they came from a French Canadian population, which is already endogamous. And then they had a small founder population then go down into Louisiana and all those areas. And then they had their own endogamous population. So it's very, very strong there. Like with the Creole cases that I've seen, you're looking at a lot of matches over 200 cents of Morgans. And, you know, it's just crazy trying to decipher it. So you have to use those much higher average segments because it's just, yeah, it's just crazier. Now, the other thing you can do is also a little bit simpler is just look at the longest segment. And for, as an example, again, Jewish endogamy, what anything where the longest segment is 10 centimorgans or below, that is a very low confidence match. 11 centimorgans to 20 centimorgans, you're kind of a medium confidence. 21 centimorgans to 30 centimorgans, uh, longest segments, you're at a very, you know, you're at a high confidence. And 31 centimorgans, longest segment or higher, you're extreme high confidence. So two different ways to look at it. Average segment size and then your longest segment. So just two different ways to view it, I guess. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Stephen. I, I truly appreciate that. Um, yes, I, I agree, Brian. I wish that we could see the segments on Ancestry. Yeah, that I I don't know if it will ever happen, but I'm crossing my fingers that eventually it will. That eventually it will. For anyone who doesn't know, we don't get a chromosome browser on Ancestry where we actually see the segments and can do DNA painting. So... Um, ancestry DNA tools seem to be the best, but there's so few people in Europe or at least Scandinavia. Um, yeah, ancestry DNA, especially recently has been rolling out some really unique and amazing tools. It's just a shame that they don't have some of the tools that my heritage has, uh, available that, you know, I think kind of make it a lot better, uh, especially the match comparison pages. So when you look at a shared match on ancestry, it will show you, or when it'll show you your shared match list. You look at a match, you look at what matches you both share, but then it doesn't show you how much those shared matches are matching both you and your match, which can be a big help. And for like just talking recently about endogamous populations, it's very helpful for endogamous populations because when you're looking at shared matches, you'll have almost everyone's a shared match, but then the true shared matches is you look at how much both of you are actually matching and you want to find ones where it actually is significant for both of you. Um, so, but yeah, Ancestry has some really great tools. Uh, not in the app, but on Ancestry, I've compared my cousin and I to see what segments we share. I'm not sure what you mean, Brian. Wait, you can see... What segment? Wait, are you just talking about like the visual segment? Or are you talking about an actual in-depth, like the the actual segment numbers, like the start point, the stop point, all of that? Because I think, I'm trying to remember if they do actually have a visual of that. Um, you're very welcome. Thank you again for the uh, super chat. Yeah, just like we were talking about, no chromosome browser. Would it that match to many clusters be a sign of endogamy? Um, it could. I, I I think that's I kind of a broad question in a sense. Would a DNA match that matches to many clusters be a sign of endogamy? I think it's more. It, there's a sign of endogamy if you have many DNA matches matching to many clusters. Because if you have a DNA match that's matching to many clusters, there's the possibility that for whatever reason, you both are matching to a lot of clusters. So maybe you're like double cousins or something. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess it could, it could be some sort of indication of maybe a very light endogamy in some sort of way or something. I'm not, yeah. But I, I, it would need to be many DNA matches. Because like if it's just one it's not going to affect being able to cluster up everything else. Whereas with when you're dealing with endogamy and you're looking at an auto cluster, it's just like one big square of everybody. So 
Okay, interesting. I'll have to take a look and see about that then if it's a if it's a beta tool because that's definitely something I'd want to check out if they're rolling out, even if it's not an actual chromosome browser, but just a kind of visual of where you're matching because then you can at least kind of visually correlate it to a DNA painting. Do you think family search trees are accurate going back to the Bible? Uh, well, I am very much of the belief that, um, that, you know, it doesn't meet the genealogical proof standard, especially when you're talking about going back to the Bible. Um, in terms of family search trees, just generally, I think, I think of it very much in the same way as any trees I find online where, you know, I know it's user generated, not all of it. I know family search has kind of done a lot of work too, but a lot of it's user generated and a lot of it is especially user edited. So that means that some trees may be very accurate. Some might not be, and it's just going to vary depending on who actually built that tree. Um, but in terms of like, once you kind of reach that point where it starts getting into the biblical family trees and stuff, I mean, that's far beyond my expertise. And in my opinion, I, doesn't meet up with the genealogical proof standard. The actual chromosome location starting endpoints that the matches share if that is coming game changer. Agreed. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. So, all right, let's let's do uh, let's do another question. Um, oh, I see some up here. See mystery relative. Um, hi, my great grandfather is adopted, and I don't know anything about him. He is my father's 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 father. Monty Python vibes. I haven't done any DNA tests yet. No, relatively little. How much can I find out through testing? Um, P.S. My great aunt is into the family tree and res has run into a brick wall. I'm not sure what she has done so far. And unfortunately, I am not particularly close to her and have only met her once. Um, okay. So obviously the big thing that you could do is DNA testing. Um, before DNA testing, you can definitely jump into the records. And if your great aunt is quite into the family tree, even if you aren't necessarily that close, knowing, <laughs> knowing if I had any random relative contact me, which I've had some of my random, you know, second cousins and people like that, just like, Hey, can you tell us about the family? I'm ecstatic. So if you reach out to her, she might get, have a lot for you. And she might've already figured out a lot of stuff that might be helpful as you pursue um, figuring this out. But if you do DNA testing, that's going to be the best way. And even more doing DNA testing with the oldest generations in the family. So the fact that your great aunt, assuming she's from the same side, so that would, I'm assuming she's your grandfather's sister. So we're talking about her grandfather is adopted. Well, having her do a DNA test would be the best thing as well as anyone else in the family who's of her generation. So if, you know, if your grandfather had other siblings who are alive and you can have them do multiple of them do DNA testing, that could actually be very helpful. Even better, if you can get two or three, like, so if you get your great aunt and then maybe even your grandfather's alive, uh, but if not, if any other siblings, you know, if you can get two or three of them and then also you've done a DNA test and then hopefully other cousins have done DNA tests, you can do what's known as visual phasing. And visual phasing is something where you really can break, or it's where you break down your DNA to see um, which grandparent each piece is inherited from. So actually, let me see if I can show it. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to show you all something because I did this uh, recently after taking the grip course uh, by Blaine Bettinger, so GRIP being the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh. And I had actually never really done visual phasing much. Um, you know, I, I, I knew about it and I just hadn't, when I first learned about it, I just hadn't had enough people do DNA testing. 
And then when I took the course and Blaine discussed doing visual phasing with things other than just your, um, you know, siblings, I was like, oh my gosh, I could do it because I have, you know, my sister's DNA tested, my grandmother's DNA tested. I've had a lot of others do DNA testing. And so let me see if I can find like a good one. So this is what visual phasing looks like. So this is my chromosome seven. And here is uh, J and M. That's my, my sister and I. This is my paternal aunt and I. This is my paternal, or sorry, this is my paternal aunt and my sister. This is my paternal aunt and I. This is myself and my grandmother. And this is my sister and my grandmother. And so what you do is by looking at the recombination points. So basically we've inherited our DNA and my sister and I have different DNA, but we can, by looking at the recombination points, we can kind of get an idea of where the DNA was recombining from our grandparents. But because I also have my grandmother tested, I instantly know what DNA is coming from her. So here's like my, here's my chromosome seven here. And you can see the top I've determined is paternal, the bottom I've determined as maternal, and then you can see how it's broken up. So like this little segment right here, that's my grandpa Simon. And so when we look up here at the comparison between my sister and I, we can see that we both, that's a, that, that gray right there, that means that there's a half region match between my sister and I. So when we're looking at DNA, we always say two pairs of chromosomes. So Half region match means we're matching on only one out of the two in the pair. Whereas a full region match, which is going to be the blue sections. I don't have any on here. Um, so like up above, the bottom part is kind of their segment prediction. The top part is each singular snip. So the yellow is a half match. The green is a full region match. But by comparing all of these, you can see how by going down the lines, it creates that. So how is this helpful in terms of determining a grandparent, as is the question that we have? Or I guess assuming that the great aunt and the siblings actually are willing to DNA test, then what happens is, is that by figuring out, okay, which is the grandparent, which one's coming from which, you can figure out, okay, well, we want to find out this specific grandfather. And once we figure out which parts of the segment are from that grandfather, we can then look at our matches and see what matches are matching on those segments. And then those say, then those matches are most likely coming from that side. Even more, if I know I have a recombination point right here on my paternal line, right? But then up on my paternal line, we see that it goes a little bit further. Well, if I have a match that is in these two regions right there, I know that it's going to be a paternal match, not a maternal match, but a paternal match because it's going over the recombination point in my maternal line. So there's, there's the only way that that match could be through a maternal match is if they're sharing DNA with me from both sides of my maternal family. So my maternal grandmother and my maternal grandfather. So this visual phasing is super, super helpful. Um, so let's see if I can, uh, maybe I can show a couple of more. All right, let's see. Let's see if I can find any like really cool looking ones. Um, and just as Brian said, this is exactly why having a chromosome browser in Ancestry would be a game changer. So, let's see if I have any really good ones. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll go with... Oh, wait, oh, yeah, I have these ones down here. I forgot about these ones. Let's do this. All 
All right. So here's my chromosome four. And so this one kind of, once again, you see this, but it, this one kind of has a little bit of a cleaner look to it. Um, so, but you can just see like when you see tracing up these lines, how it really separates it out. And then when you break it down like this, it just, it just makes things so, so simple. And it really makes it so that when you're looking at your matches, especially with NPEs, where you just, you know, you can figure out how your proven in or your proven sides connect because you can look at your genetic matches and see the ancestors that you know they should have that you both have. But then for the ones that you don't know what your ancestry is, it's a lot harder. And this is a perfect way to be able to figure that out. But you can see how just, you know, it, it can be very difficult, not as straightforward because with the recombination points, it's not exact. Testing is not perfect. So you can see how I've determined this recombination point is about right here. And the main reason for that is because my sister ended up having that recombination point right there with our grandmother. But for myself and my, my paternal aunt, this is, you know, this was something different. And so the recombination point isn't exactly in the same spot. But then right here, we can see that for my grandma Betty, that it is, you know, it is a match for me. But then like for my sister, you can see how it doesn't actually call this a segment for her that's matching, even though it's all yellow and green up here. And so that's probably just because this is such a small little part of the segment where we aren't matching at that, um, it, it just didn't even pick it up as a segment, but we can kind of see that what's happening is that it's just the recombination point that I had from my maternal line is just a little bit off from what the recombination point was, what my sister had from our maternal line. So close that window and let's go back to the Reddit. So mystery relative. I need to I need to turn off the brand th <laughs> the banner thing. I just realized that it's been going this whole time. I mean, it is really useful though. It's probably something that wouldn't be too bad to have on all the time. Um, all right, and let's see. Talk to your aunt. Yeah, would be helpful to know what time frame your great great grandfather lived as well as where he was from. Yeah, that could actually. That does change the difficulty of how the research may be. DNA testing, definitely the best way. And I should say, I, I, one of the questions that a lot of people, I think, ask in general is just, you know, which DNA test should I take? What's the best way to go about it? Should I do multiple? And it really varies depending on, I guess, more of your budget than anything. Because in my opinion, the best way is to buy it through Ancestry and then do the uploads to Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, GEDmatch, GenieNet, Genie, any, anywhere you can really do an upload, I suggest doing it. Um, obviously, read the terms of service and you know understand that there are risks involved with uploading your DNA to databases. Um, but informed consent is a good thing. So, you know, be informed. And then once you do, Go ahead and consent. Speaking of which, I do also suggest looking into opting in your DNA from law enforcement. Um, I'm a little biased having worked in the field, but for anyone who hasn't done it, if you're in Family Tree DNA uh, and or GEDmatch and you're willing to have law enforcement get access to your DNA uh, for uh, research into investigative genetic genealogy, definitely go in and do that. I actually have a video about how to do that. There are risks, as I said, informed consent, go and learn about everything uh, before you do it. But I highly suggest doing it, especially in the sense that you can help people uh, in finding their missing relatives and then also help bring justice to case unsolved cases. So uh, please opt in. They aren't cloning you. That is very true. And, and what they see, if you go and watch the series I did on Mr. Beat, I show li almost literally what we see. And it's exactly what you see when you're doing these consumer DNA tests. There's no difference. Um, the only ones, well, I guess GEDmatch is a little different because instead of GEDmatch, they use what's known as GEDmatch Pro, 
which is a much more limited website. You get a lot fewer tools. And then if you're doing what's known as Contelligence DNA kits, which I'm planning to do a video about Contelligence, those DNA kits, those results look very different. Very, very, very different. It's a whole different world. So, all right, I think I'm going to... I think I'm going to call this one solved because basically all you have to do is you, you need to figure out to figure out an adopted second great grandfather, get as many relatives as you can in DNA test from that side. And once you've done that, then using the shared DNA matches, see what you can figure out in terms of can you find a bunch of people that you don't know how are related to you and your family, but are matching you and your family and they all come from the same family. So kind of can you find multiple matches where you don't know how, how they connect to you, but you can see how they connect to each other. And then you can do a what are the odds tool. Um, but I'm not going to go further into that. We're just going to call this question. Uh, da, 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 da. Reviewed. All right, let's see. <laughs> just, just to look at a meme on stream. <laughs> when you log in and get a close DNA match you don't recognize <laughs> you know I really need to use this face much more for my YouTube thumbnails because I I don't know sometimes I feel like maybe I get a little too clickbaity with some of my thumbnails but other times I'm like yeah maybe I'm just not doing it enough <laughs> alright let's see uh, looking through chat. Hello, Jared on Ancestry. I noticed that one of my matches was 41 total centimorgan, shared centimorgans across two segments. And the longest segment was 48 centimorgans. What is going on with their math? Uh, what's probably going on with the math here is what we were discussing before the timber algorithm. And so they will have what's known as an unweighted score and then a weighted score. And it sounds like for whatever reason, it shows you the weighted score for your total shared DNA. So 41 centimorgans across two segments, but then the unweighted score, the longest segment, 48 centimorgans, uh, it just, it was unweighted for whatever reason. So um, that's my guess, unless there's, you know, maybe there's some other glitch going on with their system, which does happen. I mean, Ancestry, they're constantly updating stuff and I feel like I'll constantly be researching and then the site's just not working or trying to add stuff in just doesn't work. And yeah, but that's, I think that's what's going on. Um, with my Ancestry paid membership, would I be able to manage multiple family members unpaid account and be able to use three lines with their DNA results? Yes, that's that's what I do. Whenever any relative, anyone, anyone who's done a DNA test, as soon as they share it with you, you'll be able to look at their matches and everything, and be able to do uh, whatever you need. The only thing is, depending on what status they make you in terms of a viewer, collaborator, or editor, that's going to change um, how much you can do. So certain levels you'll definitely want because then you can do their color clustering. I forgot exactly what they call it, but basically it's just you put dots on certain profiles that are a certain color to indicate families or different things. Um, but yeah, you can, you can do that. Um, is big Y harder to read than regular? Are the benefits worth the extra cost for someone who never has used Y DNA, but has extensive use with autosomal? It is different than autosomal. That's for sure. Um, in terms of big Y, there are certain parts of it that are going to be much easier to understand than other parts of it. So the basic match lists are going to look fairly familiar because they're going to look fairly similar to the autosomal ones. Granted, it's not giving you centimorgans. It's instead going to tell you, uh, well, you, you're going to have different matching. You're going to have your STR matching options. So you can look at how are people matching you STR wise, but then you're going to have your big Y matching option as well to see STRs and SNP comparisons. Um, but then like, you're going to also have access to what's known as the block tree, which is very similar to like Y fulls tree. Um, just instead it's going to look like blocks. So actually, you know what? I'm going to see if I might be able to find. 
Let's see if I can I'm gonna see if I can find some uh, something I can use <laughs> to show all you uh, log into a Y DNA that we have for an upcoming one. Uh, an upcoming YouTuber family tree series. Let's see. I just want to make sure I don't show anything that should be private. So <laughs> bear with me as I go through this uh, to, to pull it up. All right, I just, the hard part is I need to figure out how to show this without showing everything. <laughs> um, oh, it might just be too difficult. It might be too difficult. All right, we're going to go. We're going to do this just a little bit differently. So I'm taking a snapshot, and then we're going to look at the snapshot. I definitely don't want to get other YouTubers mad at me because <laughs> I'm showing stuff that I should not be showing. That is one of the things that I'm very adamant about when I contact YouTubers for the series is like, look, I keep privacy very serious. I'm not trying to mess with anybody's uh, privacy and dox any information or something. Do, 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 do. All right. Screenshot. There we go. So... What we are looking at here, this is the block tree for Max Miller from Tasting History with Max Miller. And we did had him do a big Y DNA test. This is actually something that uh, Family Tree DNA sponsored for us. Uh, so they, they sent us one out to have Max do. And these were the results. And this is what the block tree looks like. And so it is not exactly the most straightforward, but at the same time, it does kind of make sense. Like, okay, here we have this, this big block. This is one shared ancestor right here. And then we have this big block where all of them descend from one ancestor. And this is basically a cluster. But then here we have it where not only does it cluster, but then we have one big cluster then it breaks down into three more, and then each of those three kind of break down further. And so then you get each of these little clusters where they're – this is basically like a big family tree. So obviously, though, this is much further back. We're talking about you know hundreds if not thousands of years for a lot of this stuff. Um, so like I think for all of them right here in this group, they all – basically share an ancestor that is someone that we have identified in the family tree for Max. And now what we're trying to figure out is how this big cluster fits in with this bigger thing. Um, but this is, so this is what a big block tree looks like for Y DNA. It's, it's, it's very, very similar to the Y full tree, just in the sense of, that, you know, it's just kind of showing you your haplogroups and things like that. Um, so we're just going to go to the y full here so you can see with the y full. Oh, I just realized that the screen is... No. There's... <laughs> Having a little bit of an issue right now. Hold on one second.
All right. <laughs> I want to make this legible for everybody. Make this as big as possible and that so you can actually read it. Update layout. All right. Hopefully that should be a lot better because I realized that I was blocking the top here. Um every everything's look, looking good, everybody. Everything look good. I can't believe I already threw an hour. All right, so this is this is what a Y full tree looks like. And so this is kind of not that dissimilar from a uh, block tree. It's just in a different view, but you can look at it similar to a block tree. So then as we go further back, it's just, it, that's what the, this is just what Y haplogroups are is it's just one big family tree. So like this is, where am I? Where am I? I think this is me right here. No, that's not me. Where am I? I'm J Y B. Da, 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 da. Okay, so this is me J F two one zero one one six seven. This is my haplogroup, and so looking back at the chart, so this is me right here, and then we go back, and we have this tree. We go back again, and now here I'm down here, and so we can kind of just see. As we go further back, it adds in. And then even more, you can see the countries that all of the different people, their Y-DNA traces to. So here, up here, we have India, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Libya, England, Russia, Russia. Now, here's what's interesting, too, being that I'm Jewish, that a lot of, you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, do Jews come from the Levant? And some people say yes, some people say no. But the what the actual DNA is showing, and especially the project by Avitainu, but even more than that, is just that Jews, yes, they are from the Levant. And so with my Y DNA, I can actually see fairly clearly, like this ancestor right here, this snip right here, almost everybody who descends from it are Jewish. But then when you go one step out further, then you start to get Saudi Arabia, Qatar, then you get that India, Iraq. But then, let's see, where? Oh, it's all the way up here. <laughs> see, I wonder if simple chart. Yeah, that makes it better. So I'm this right here. So let's go back even further. So yeah, so we see again, we go out further. Now here, what are we looking at? Libya, Libya, Iraq. Go out further. And we look over here and we have, well, look at that, a whole bunch of Palestinian, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia. So the y, my Y DNA shows very clearly that my Y chromosome lineage connects most closely to Jews and then two people from the Levant. Um, granted, you know, there's a little bit of the India there and, you know, different stuff, but that's, you know, that's the thing about humans. They migrate. So this is why the why haplogroup is so helpful. But in terms of that block tree I was showing earlier, this is the similar, a similar thing. So, all right. Let's get back to some questions. Oh, it's not showing that. Lame. I actually, yeah, I want to show window. All right. Try to fix this a little bit. All right. So let's go to some of the older ones. I should probably start getting some of these older ones cleared out. Let's see if there's anything that stands out as really good. <laughs> the stream is popping off more than the gaming one for sure. For anyone who doesn't know, I started a gaming channel too called Genie Gaming. So <laughs> go go like and subscribe that. Oh, I gotta okay. We're gonna move this up here. I'm slowly 
slowly but surely we're figuring this thing out. But yeah, I did I did a, a gaming uh, live stream last night from like 1 a.m. to 2 2 a.m. just to kind of just test everything out, and I was trying multi-screen stuff, and yeah, so. Um, Everyone, be sure to smash that like button if you are enjoying the stream. Be sure to subscribe. And if you're on Twitch, be sure to follow. Same for those on Facebook. And yeah, thank you everyone for hanging out and checking out my first official public live stream on one of my channels. <laughs> Although I guess the Genie Gaming people got the technical official first one. All right, so we need to pick a, a question to go through. All right, let's see. Let's see about this one. All right. Hi, as you can tell, I am African American, but what I'm confused about is how I'm getting North African and Mesoamerican popping up. I know both of my parents are African American, but I can say I'm really not close with my father's side of the family. Hopefully, you can give me some pointers. So, hopefully, this C full image will work this time. Yeah, it does. All right. So. We have 52% Nigerian, 18.7% Sierra Leonean, 8.4% Kenyan, 4% North African, 15.4% Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, and Welsh, and then 1.5% Mesoamerican and Andean. And then do we have any other images? Got a few, it looks like. How many do we have here? All right. Oh, we have five. Okay, so... We're going to pull up all five. We'll go through them each. And then do they say what each of them are? Okay. All right. So I think it starts here. So, all right. So we've already gone through this. Make sure I can see the chat while I do this. And then let me read the chat real quick. Okay. Huh. Only the cool kids got the enlisted street. <laughs> All right. Back to this. All right. So we've seen that. And now we have family tree DNA. So we have our My Heritage, now family tree, 80% Africa. West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, I'm not going to read them all. Europe, 17%. And then Asia, Myanmar, less than 1%. Middle East and North Africa, less than 3%. And then here we're getting... I am not familiar with this one. What is this one? I actually... Does anyone know which DNA test this one is? I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm familiar with this one. But we're getting 78.4% Sub Saharan, 14% European, 5.6% Middle Eastern North African, 1.3% Indigenous American, and then 0.7% East Asian. So going through these, I mean, there's certainly a commonality of you're getting a small percentage of some sort of. American or Asian reading, which there is a correlation between both. And they, I think a lot of people on this stream probably already know that there is a, a couple of sites at least that will lump Native American and East Asian together. Um, so here, it seems like you are getting that consistently enough that even though it's a trace result, you do have a bit of a higher confidence in it. But the other thing is, is that when it comes to these admixtures, the confidence will vary depending on population groups, as well as how sub-regional are things broken down. So when you're looking at a continental level, a much higher confidence. So the fact that this is coming up in multiple tests, but it's also a different continent than what you're getting, which is basically Europe and Africa then you do have more high confidence there. So because of that, I start leaning, even though it's a trace result, leaning towards there seems to be something here. And going back to that, that banner that I just turned off not too long ago, we are probably going to be looking at something fourth great-grandparents 
about could be as close as a third great grandparent could be even further out. So if you build out your family tree, you may be able to find that. Now, the, one of the best ways to figure this type of thing out is to test your parents, which I know you do mention that you're not really close with your father's side of the family. I don't know if you're close with your parents at all, or if they'd even, you know, you might be able to get them to do a DNA test. Uh, but having them do a DNA test would be one of the best ways to kind of figure out, our, you know, where is it coming from? Because more than likely it's coming from just one side of the family. It is certainly possible that maybe both your parents are getting that and they're, there is a possibility this is a misread. That is always a possibility. But as I mentioned, that confidence of mine is high that it's probably not. Um, not, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm speaking in so many double negatives sometimes. I just hope I'm not screwing people up with that. But, uh, you know, I, I feel like we're probably leaning towards more of a possibility of it being true. And if you do get your parents to test and then you notice either one of them's getting that reading, the other one's not, or even more, one of them's getting a even higher reading of Mesoamerican or East Asian or Native American or whatever of that, then that's probably the side it's through. And then if you have your grandparents available to DNA test, that's even better. Another thing you can do, if you have relatives who've tested through both of your sides of the family, look through a lot of their trees and, or a lot of their results and see are any of them getting some of these readings too? So as an example, when I did the family tree for Matt Baker from Useful Charts, he came from the Levy family of Tanacook Island. And that family had the story that they were Jewish and that they came from the family of, uh, was it Raphael Moses Levy? Or I forgot exactly the name, but um, we look, one of the things we did to see, okay, how possible is that story true? Or is it just that the family took the Levy name for some other reason? Um, we should probably expect to see a lot of the cousins getting some sort of reading of Jewish. Now, Matt did not have any Jewish readings of his own, but he had a lot of cousins in the databases from the Levy sides. Granted, they're very endogamous on Tana Cook Island, so everyone was basically from the Levy side from Tana Cook. But they, a lot of them had one, two, three percent Jewish readings. Even more, a lot of the Levy cousins who had tested on 23andMe got to see, we could see their haplogroups and the haplogroups of all these Levy men matched up to what's expected of the Levy YDNA haplogroup that's been identified through extensive research. So there was a lot of things connecting to show that, yeah, that's probably right. Um, so in a similar way, you can do that here where see what your cousins are, see if you, a lot of your cousins are getting something. And if you can start to kind of pinpoint maybe which side of the family it might be coming from, if it is true, then look into the possibility of maybe a Y DNA test or a mitochondrial DNA test will show that because if you're purely Y DNA or you're purely mitochondrial line, uh, so basically your father's 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 father line, your patrilineal line, or your mother's 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 line, your matrilineal line, they if they have Native American ancestry, like it's it it goes through Native American ancestry through that, you will get a haplogroup that correlates to that, and that you can tell quite easily. So. That's a possibility too. And it might not be you that ends up needing to take the Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA test. It might be a relative of yours because, you know, maybe it's not your father's 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 line. Maybe it's your maternal grandmother's father's 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 line. And now you've got to find a uh, paternal descendant of your maternal grandmother's paternal family. So, you know, that's where you start getting into some of the more, um, crazy research of like, okay, first I got to accomplish this, find this person, get them to agree to DNA test and then continue. All right. So we're going to close out all this stuff and then yeah, let's uh, call this one answered. I will say I am quite happy that I've been uh, answering these in a decent amount of time. I was very worried that I would end up spending like 30 minutes per each question. So Maven put an article in Discord in the community chat channel. Is that a thing you've heard of before? All right, let me go take a look. Uh, while I go and look for that, for anyone who's not familiar, I have a Discord. 
actually, yeah, no, I'm not going to do it on stream. I don't want to have a message pop up that should be private. Um, okay, so let's see. The article. Oh, the microchimerism in the human female brain. Now, when it comes to chimeras, that, that I, that's where you you have like more than one DNA, I believe. And when it gets into that, that's the kind of stuff where that's kind of beyond my knowledge of DNA. Because then you're starting to talk about very uncommon occurrences that you know aren't really genealogically relevant, as far as I know. Um, but very interesting. So for anyone who wants to see. Uh, what I'm talking about, go ahead and uh, join the Discord. I'm sure I have some place somewhere where you'll be able to join. If uh, Charlie, if you can, if you're on stream and you can help me out and share that um, the the link to join the Discord, that'd be awesome. So, All right. Let's jump back to the question. <laughs> yeah hopefully hopefully i can get charlie on that if he doesn't i'll figure it out in a second so let's jump to uh let's jump to another question see if we can find a question that's not dna but an actual question all right jewish ancestry oh there we go charlie with the link so and i'm actually I'm going to share that to all the destinations too. So everyone who's, uh, even if you're not on YouTube, but if you're on YouTube, you just got it twice. All right. Hello, Genie Vlogger. I believe that I have a lot of Jewish ancestry. I shared my modern populations below from my true ancestry DNA sites. To make a long story short, the site advises that I can fit in the Italian Jewish population. I'm pretty sure my Jewish comes from Sephardic Ashkenazi Italian Jewish. Uh, yeah, this kind of stuff. I mean, I really do not use my true ancestry. It's really not a genealogically useful thing. And yeah, I, there's really not much I can comment about it. Honestly, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has any experience with it, but like, you know, I mean, it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, my understanding with it is it's more of a website about seeing how you are connected to ancient remains and DNA, but yeah, let's see what other people said. If anyone had any, all right, these genetic distance by deleted, whoever this was, <laughs> These genetic distances you posted don't necessarily indicate any Jewish ancestry at all. Very true. The closest Jewish population is seventh on the list. That's really far out, to be honest. I'm full Ashkenazi, and Ashkenazi is my closest population, with my second closest group being West Sicilian. So they seem to have tested there. I'm obviously not West Sicilian. If you're primarily of just one ancestry, the closest genetic distance will be correct, not the seventh or eighth. Um, and then let's see, I have three great grandparents born in Sicily. And okay. Yeah. So with this one, this question, the answer is kind of an even, <laughs> I don't even know how to put it, but it, it, it's pretty much like I say with all of the admixture questions, it's just an even more out there one in a sense of that it gives you less reliable information. So um, yeah, it's just, I, there's not much you can read from it. The best thing to do is do your genealogy and build it out. And, you know, I know having Sephardic ancestry in Livorno, Italy, there are records available. Tracing back from the 17th century, I think even further back and forward all the way to modern times. And a lot of stuff is constantly still being digitized from there as well. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Alexandra. I use my true ancestry and actually helped me to understand my DNA results. Of course, I only consider the sample matches that are really close to me. Okay. So 
All right, I'm just gonna call this one <laughs> answered. <laughs> not much, not much to really say there for me. Here. All right. So let's see if we can get some other questions. All right, we have a haplogroup question. Let's see what Manny asks. Haplogroup QBZ1717, any information on this haplogroup? It's paternal. How about A2J? So I got them via big Y DNA test via family tree DNA, the best one to do it through. On 23andMe, it gave me the basic QM971. So it looks like someone already took a look. I searched QB71717 and went to the SNPs lab. Phone's like going crazy. Melissa has several different gravesite DNA tests where they look up your line. So yeah, so for AT, A2J, ATJ, A2J using a SNP tracker, ancient DNA points to South America as well as North American. For current tests, Mexico is highlighted as the most common, same as Q, whatever. So yeah, thank you, Coder Caleb. So lots of information. Honestly, that's kind of that's one of the best things to do if you're looking at trying to figure out information about your haplogroups is there's a lot of these different websites you can look up. So like Snip Tracker, that's one of the websites. Um, you can honestly just Google it half the time. So like, what's the main one? Yeah, it's QB. So you can Google it and then, all right, well, that came up. But like you can see, okay, well, here we have our family tree DNA and it's generating a haplogroup. And so you can get a map of it and it tells you just some information. And um, yeah, lots of stuff. All right. Um, we'll call this one. God, I actually had something here to drink. I was like, man, I'm parched. Actually, I need to find my chapstick. It's starting to get really dry around here. It's getting cold in my area. I don't know how it is for everybody else. I know I had chapstick around here. Where? All right, it looks like I'm not chapping up until, uh, <laughs> until after stream. So, all right, all right. So, still, all right. Looking, uh, looking at the numbers, still sticking strong. Sixty, uh, sixty-seven people. So, all right. Digging it, digging it. All right. Did I mark the? There we go. Let's mark it. I need to make sure I mark these. And look at this. This one's high up there, and it's from two years ago. So what I might end up doing is I might end up actually doing this uh, as kind of like a weekly stream. I don't know if I'll do it every every Friday at 2 p.m., but I'm probably going to plan to do every, the same time every week, kind of make it a schedule thing. All right. seems to me a person gets the best ethnicity results from using the company labs rather than downloading it externally. What are your thoughts or experience with this? So what I think they're saying is that it's better, like if you're going to do a DNA test with family tree DNA, it's better to test through their lab. You'll get better results from them than if you uploaded from Ancestry. And I think that that's kind of correct, but it, it kind of varies because there's a question, first of all, of how true is either one, but technically... I think it, the reason why it technically is a little bit better is because with each site, they're all testing about 600 to 700,000 SNPs, but they're not all testing the same 600 to 700,000 SNPs. Granted, there is a lot of overlap, but each one is testing ones that only they're testing or only a few of the other sites are testing. And so if you test at one site, 
you're going to be testing all they're going to be reading on their site. Whereas if you upload a DNA test from Ancestry to Family Tree DNA, there's probably going to be SNPs that Family Tree DNA tests that Ancestry doesn't test. So that'll throw things off a bit. And then on top of that, there's probably going to be SNPs that Ancestry tested that um, Family Tree DNA didn't test. So when you upload it, all of that information kind of becomes null. Oh, didn't mean to hit my mic. Kind of becomes null. So you know, I would presume that that would probably make the readings less reliable based on their ability to do it because it, you know, you're putting in the right information that fits perfectly into what their algorithm is and coming up with the, the ethnicity results. Um, but I've really never compared that too much in terms of like looking at a website and seeing testing with the company and then uploading results from the other companies. What do the differences look like? And that might actually be a good idea for a video comment. If anyone thinks that would be a good idea for a video comment below, cause that, that might be interesting. So basically what I do is I, I mean, I've already tested on a lot of sites, but like, you know, I've tested through family tree DNA. So upload my, my heritage. And that, you know, if I can, a lot of these sites though, they make it so that if they find a duplicate's being uploaded, they'll say, oh, there's already a duplicate that you've uploaded. Or, yeah. So, but I don't know. I, I Not all of them do that, though, because I know that, you know, they've got to account for twins and stuff. So I'll have to do that. Um, going through... Twenty three and Me was the most accurate for it. So Ryan said he's already done that, and Twenty Three and Me was the most accurate for him. So yeah, I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely put that on the list of uh, list of stuff to to do as a video. I've my list of videos is so long. I have so many video ideas that I've even gotten started on. I'm going to be doing a video about how to pronounce genealogy genealogy <laughs> genealogy 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 <laughs> okay let's uh all right questions on interpreting results uh, i feel like that's just more admixture stuff worded a different way probably i don't want to assume, assume too much but where are we at oh wow yeah we're at an hour and a half Hour and a half. Okay, so let's see. Let's go with this one. Kind of the same stuff, but by paper trail, I only have French ancestry. Do these results make sense? And always the big question is only have French ancestry. How far back on how many lines? And uh, let's see. Okay. Just discovered two years ago. June, January 25th, 2022. Jeez, I am so behind on these. Um, okay, so I thought I would ask him in the community what to think about my admixture results from 23andMe and my heritage, my family paper trail until 7th to 11th generation so far, depending on the branches. I haven't found an ancestor outside of France. Not surprised the British Isles because my paternal great-grandfather was from Normandy, and I know these populations are very close genetically. What surprised me more is the very high Spanish Iberian percentages. My paternal grandmother's line is from Dor. I'm not going to pronounce that right. Southwestern France, uh, where, you know, not too far from uh, Spain, which I guess could be close enough, but that shouldn't account for more than 25% or maybe like 30% of random distribution rate. My mother's side is from Ardeche. I'm sure I pronounced that terribly, which Ardeche which is still Southern France, but more Eastern. Could my heritage still consider this Iberian? I'm sorry if this is too specific. All right, let's look at this. So Northwestern European, 70.5%. Southern European, 29.5%. Broadly Southern, 25 And then a large amount, French and German, Large, a uh, good amount, British and Ir Irish, broadly Northwestern European, all makes sense. And then the main question is this Southern European. I think it really is just kind of, it's, I, I, I imagine it's probably fairly common for people from France to get a lot of 
uh, Spanish and stuff like that, most especially if you are from the, you know, southwestern part of France or, you know, if you're, you're in the, you know, near the Basque region, it's, you know, you're not that far. And I know that, you know, there's been a lot of population migration back and forth. <clears throat> so, you know, I, it certainly makes sense. I think the interesting thing that I'm noticing here is that for your Italian, you're actually getting Sicily as a community, which I think, you know, that to me is very interesting. And that would be this sort of thing where, you know, if there is something there, I wonder if maybe it's Sicilian. Um, so this is my heritage. Oh, wait, no, that was, that's 23 and me. This is my heritage, I think. <laughs> sometimes I look at these so much, look at all the DNA tests so much. Sometimes I get it. So, all right, Iberia, 45.4%. That is a lot. But my heritage is the one that I feel like the most people say my admixture did not match up to what I know about my family tree. All right, then East and North Europe. Or is that West? Oist. Because in, in, in Netherlands, East is Oist, I think. Oost, Oost, something like that, O-O-S-T. So, I don't know. All right, Greek and Italian, and then the Balkans. So interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it, I think it kind of makes sense. Um, let's see what uh, let's see what uh, some other people say. Yeah. Hello. I think your DNA checks out. I was confused. My grams results, whose both sides go back to France too. So I looked a video on ethnicity of France. And I found this guy, Massa Man. I've done reactions to Massa Man's videos. Um, yeah, realize help me realize how far back our DNA actually goes, and to think of DNA results as more of a migration heritage tool, not a cultural heritage validation tool. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. The way that a lot of genealogists will put it is, if you're trying to define it, I guess more by like modern country standards, which they don't always say that first part with it necessarily. But if you're trying to define it more by modern country standards and things like that, you're usually going to be getting results that kind of show you the past two to 300 years. There's some variations on what people say about that. It's really more about, you know, the past six generations or seven generations that are well represented in your DNA. Um, but yeah, you need to really think about all of the migrations, the history and you know, how a lot of population groups especially will have shared ancestry, which then make it very difficult to decipher what's a specific segment of DNA that's coming from one group and not the other. So I feel like that one's basically, basically answered kind of, you know, another one of the same admixture questions. So let's, uh, let's take a look at chat. Let's catch up. All right. Not a DNA question, but I wonder how you ended up becoming a genetic genealogist and how you ended up making videos about it. All right. Well, um, it's kind of an interesting story. It all really starts out just with me becoming interested in my family history and genealogy, which that goes back to when I was seven or eight at my cousin's bar mitzvah. My uncle had a uh, sheet of paper tracing my family line all the way back to the 17th century and it was like whoa and i just became enamored at that point and then from there i um you know would do it throughout the years just you know it back then what it was is you'd get these ancestry cds so this was like the 90s um and i you'd get these ancestry cds with like documents and stuff on it and uh then you you know have some other there were like other sources that you could kind of get but there really wasn't much available you had to like go in person to do it and i was too young to really do that well um so i just kind of stopped in between but then i got really into genealogy my senior year of college i got back into it because i found genie and genie.com and i just became absolutely obsessed with it and then of course dna was starting to really blow up at that time and i did my first dna test in 2013 i did what was known as the comprehensive of genome bundle or kit or something and basically what it was was a autosomal test the family finder test a uh, full mitochondrial dna test 
and a Y67 test. So a Y chromosome test testing 67 STR markers. And that was my first foray into things in 2013. And I just kept researching and I would get more of my, you know, I soon I had my parents testing, I had cousins testing, my grandmother tested and, you know, I got everyone doing that stuff. And then I started to find cousins or really matches that were either adoptees or I, like I already mentioned people that had Jewish results coming up and they were obviously matching me, but didn't know of any Jewish ancestry. So I started to help out all these people and building their trees. And then I think about 2016, 2017, um, well, I guess first I should mention is that throughout the 2010s, the main goal in my life was to become a full-time musician. So I was playing in bands. I was traveling around the country as a tour manager, a booking agent. Um, I was working with all sorts of bands of various types, mostly like pop punk bands and stuff like that. But the main thing was I wanted to be a musician. And so I was in a band that was touring. And in 2017, we played a show and our drummer and our guitarist got into a fight on stage. And so we had to cancel an upcoming tour because we broke up. And that week, it just so happened to be the NGS conference in Raleigh, NGS being the National Genealogical Society. And I figured, well, I'm not going on tour. Let me go to this. And I went and there was the ancestry booth. And I started talking to the one guy there and saying that, you know, I'd always thought about going professional with genealogy, but I just hadn't done it because I was worried that I'd have to get a certificate or something. And I hated school. I just hated school. I didn't want to go through any sort of programs to get a certificate or a degree or anything like that. And then when I spoke to the guy at Ancestry, he was like, yeah, a lot of genealogists don't have anything like that. They just have the experience. So he asked me, you know, what have I done? And so I showed him some of the stuff I did, including some of the documents that I had written up for my cousins who obtained Portuguese citizenship through that work, proving that they had Sephardic ancestry. And he was like, this is exactly what we need. So from there, they were talking to me about hiring me and then things ended up just not working out with getting hired by Ancestry. But I found out in the process, they were charging $125 per hour with 20 hour minimums for a project. So if you wanted to hire Ancestry Pro to do your genealogy, you were looking at at least whatever that was, I think it was $2,500. So you were looking at least paying for 20 hours minimum with a $125 per hour cost. And at the time, I was working as an optician making glasses and I was making like 20, $25 an hour. It varied based on my commission. And once I realized like, okay, I could just charge 20, $25 an hour and do it the exact same thing and that I enjoy. It was like transition instantly. And it was during that time that I was thinking, you know, maybe I should start a YouTube channel because I had already loved YouTube. I've been on YouTube since 2005. Um, like I, I originally saw YouTube as just a place to actually upload videos and like, like more of a storage thing, like Dropbox than an actual like place to advertise videos and stuff like that. And yeah, so that's the YouTube thing. It was actually something that I was on the way driving home. And I remember the exact spot that I thought of it. Every time I drive by the exact same spot, I think of the exact, I think of, oh man, this is the turn where I thought of my YouTube channel, but it popped into my head, genealogy YouTube channel. And I went home that night and I searched up genealogy on YouTube. And the only channel of substance that I could find at the time that I remember was family history fanatics. And they were still kind of fairly new on YouTube. I want to say maybe only a year or two old at that point. And then also ancestry, but being a YouTube fan, I knew YouTube was much more about the personal creator than, you know, big corporate company necessarily. And I was like, this is the perfect thing. Like I, I want to go into the private clients and this will be a great way to advertise. And if it turns into something great, if not, it's a free way to advertise my skills and pick up clients and all of that. So that's, <laughs> a very long-winded way of uh, how I got into genetic uh, genealogy. So let me let me go back through the chat, see if there's anything I missed that I should probably 
highlights. So, yeah, Drea, my heritage is admixtures are comically wrong sometimes. I allegedly have a decent percentage of Finnish. The only European ancestry I've confirmed is some kind of Southern European at a much lower percentage. Yeah, I mean, my heritage really does have a bad reputation for their admixture, but the tools on the website just, they're, they're so much better. The way that I always like to think about the admixture stuff is like people will talk about which site's better and based on the admixture. And to me, that's almost like arguing which car is better and saying which one's better based on the radio. Like, yeah, the radio is going to kind of make a bit of a difference. It's going to be significant, but it's much, much less significant than the larger parts of the entire car. You know, all of the DNA tools, all of the DNA matches, your auto clusters, the shared comparisons and the chromosome browsers. Oh my. <laughs> so, you know, that's, yeah, that's kind of how I feel uh, about that. That's how I feel about that. Let's see what else we we got to. Okay. So essentially, we have your former bandmates getting into a fight on stage and think, yes, you do, <laughs> you do, you do have them to thank. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have ever pursued genealogy full time. I might have, I might have eventually. One, you know, probably once I realized that, oh yeah, you can just go and do it. Um, but yeah, I'm, it's possible. I would have never thought of doing this uh, YouTube ch channel or anything. Um, so actually, yeah, you know what? I'm going to. Uh, uh, just so you all can see, this is my old band. Uh, um, what's a good one? What's a good one we should play? Hmm. I will right, we'll just do La Bumba. Hopefully the audio on that's good. This is the old band. This is us on tour 2015. This is us. Uh, we were playing in uh, Lawrenceville, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. One hundred percent agree, Elizabeth. One hundred percent. Can everyone hear that? I hope I hope you all can. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I literally say, can you hear that? And then I muted it so I could blow my nose. <laughs> can you hear it now? Yeah, the water between. Is there some now? Hopefully there is. Still no sound. Well, if there if there is no sound, hopefully uh, hopefully y'all can go and check it out. So yeah, this very different time in my life. So no, not there. Yeah. Oh man, I. Uh, I'm still learning this streaming stuff, so I'll get it. I'll get it down. I'll figure that out. I had I had trouble with that on the gaming stream last night, getting it to go. We can hear you talk, but not sing and play. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm gonna try. Let's we're gonna try one more time. One more time. So actually, funny enough, uh, one of my bandmates that. Uh, was in the band when, when it quit. He and I were the ones that didn't get into a fight. We were the ones on the side of the stage going, dude, what are we supposed to do? Uh, he actually just got chosen to be on a show on NBC called Chasing... What is it? Chasing Chasing the Dream? Yeah, chasing the Dream. 
So he, he, he was on this show chasing the dream, which is all about pursuing becoming like a famous musician. He got chosen to be a, uh, mentored by bobby bones from nashville who's like really big in the country if you're in the country so so that guy this guy right here donnie sill used to he was uh he was in my band so you can you can go on here and check check it out um No idea from here, but see, there's Donnie. There he is again. <laughs> Going on to do big things. All right. Stupid question, but did my heritage remove the what's it called, the smaller region of teenagers from the site? I think my heritage was taking down a lot of stuff recently. I, I don't know I, if anyone else can comment on that, but I feel like I remember seeing my heritage. I know 23Me was doing that. But I think my heritage might have done that too. So I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. So, all right. Can you all hear this now? All right. I don't think no sound still. Yeah. I don't think anyone really came here to see, <laughs> see my old band. You can look it up. I'm going to answer, uh, see if I can. Oh, wait, no, we're actually, we're about to come up on two hours. I'm only going to be doing two hours. Let's see. Let's see if I can answer one or two more questions before we go. Yeah, still no sound. I'll figure it out. I'll get it figured out for everyone, hopefully on the next stream. So speaking of which, like I said, I'm going to try to do these consistently. And, you know, the aim is is to possibly do it every Friday at 2 o'clock, same time. Um, but, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I'm able to keep that schedule. But I think that's what I'll do. So, Next Friday, 2 o'clock, hopefully I'll have it figured out. Maybe I can play some of my old band stuff. And then I was in a band before that, too, called The Rest Is Up To You. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that. <laughs> let's, get, let's get back to uh, answering questions. Uh, what? Can I save this to my page after the live stream ends? So this is going to be saved. I think you'll be able to watch it on Twitch. I I think I have it. I think on all three, I think Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube, I have it set up where you'll be able to go back and watch live streams. But 100% when this stream is over, you'll be able to go to YouTube and go to my Professional Genealogist Reacts channel and should be under the live tab. So... Uh, did I do that to your list? No, I did not. That's going to be one. I'm going to do that through my main channel. So I'm going to do all of the Reddit questions and stuff like that through the reactions channel, just because that's kind of where I do those videos. So it makes the most sense. And then on the main channel, I'll do stuff like that tier one. I probably do a lot of research videos. Like one thing I was saying to uh, Mr. Beat that he seemed to really like the idea of was doing something like building trees on stream, like Abraham Lincoln's tree you know building it from scratch like just saying okay with the basic info of abraham lincoln and his parents let's build a tree um yeah let's see by the way thank you for choosing a time that is also doable for non-americans without getting up in the middle of the night yeah i know i my i'm gonna because i'm gonna be doing a lot of variations of streams I'm thinking I'm going to be doing them at different times of the day so that I can kind of hit a lot of different audiences. 
obviously America is going to get the uh, best times because I'm in America, but I'm thinking, you know, 2 PM for a lot of stuff. There may be some that I might do a little bit more late night, like eight o'clock, nine o'clock, just because that works a lot better for those in Australia, New Zealand. Plus I'm a bit of a night owl. And then maybe every once in a while I might be doing something a little bit early morning um, but most of the time it's probably going to be like early afternoon sort of thing, noon and all of that. So, um, let's see. All right, let's get back to the questions on Reddit. Yeah. And I know, I, I know I'm kind of not reading everybody's message. It's, uh, you know, I'm trying to, but I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to spend the entire time not getting some of these questions answered um, which oh yeah i don't i just realized i'm not sharing the screen with you that kind of help wouldn't it share share that screen all right so oh this is old reddit and eh, whatever old reddit works i actually kind of like old reddit i'm kind of i'm old school like that what can i say the only problem is that <laughs> now, now you got to do the whole back like 50 pages, but it's fine. Yes, of course, Mr. Beat would be interested in old president's family trees. Yeah. Well, that's why I told him that one is the idea because I was like, oh, he'll like that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'd probably like even better if I did Dwight Eisenhower's. Let's see this question. Where can I find information about Czech genealogy? I use Ancestry, but there's not many Czech users. Thanks. Now, I don't really know a whole lot about Czech genealogy, but one of the places I always suggest as a place to learn about where you can find more records is the Family Search Wiki. Um, so let's see if they have one on Czech because it's just, it gives you a list of everything available what sites and all of that it's available and so here we've got czechia genealogy so you can see familysearch.org slash en for english backslash wiki and then you can just search for topics and places and so it gives you all of this information um you've got this map which let's see is the map regionalized yeah so the map is regionalized so if you know the specific region you can click on it, and then you've got your lists of stuff here. But then as well, be sure to do online genealogy records because then it gives you this list. Now, it's not always going to have every single thing, but it's going to have a lot. And it's especially helpful if you've got stuff. Maybe there's something on like Find My Past or Genealogy Bank or other websites that aren't quite as commonly used. You can find you know stuff here. And then it shows you, you know if you see the dollar signs, it's a paid website database uh not all, all of them are but like here you see here's one from find my past here's something from family search here's stuff on my heritage and ancestry here's more from family search and all of that so all right yeah <laughs> i guess i'm not the only one yeah there's some things i like about new reddit but old reddit just so much better Yes, and for anyone in Discord or who wants to join the Discord, uh, which was mentioned before, um, the uh, there is a pinned genealogy site mega list in there. Um, so that uh, that should be helpful. All right, back to the questions. Back to the questions. I might I well I'm already at two hours, just uh, under two hours, so. I guess I'm going to go a little bit longer than I planned. You all get to benefit. My dogs will be the ones that will be sad because they don't get to be walked as early. Right, baby boys? Jackie boy, Peter, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Come here. Come here. You guys want to make an appearance? No? No? My my dogs are snubbing you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. Peter, you want to? Come here. Come here, Peter. Come here. Come here, baby boy. Yeah. Come to your daddy. Never mind. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> oh, uh, no, no, they're snubbing. They don't want to. All right. So let's go to the questions. So let's keep going back. If I see something, 
That looks decent. All right, remember these. Let's do this. All right. <laughs> oh, it's ethnicity estimates. I was hoping it wasn't going to be that, but all right, let's uh, let's make this bigger for everybody. Too big. All right. What's the most accurate DNA testing kit in terms of ethnicity estimates for someone from UK? Ugh. I am also not able to calculate anything myself as I'm adopted. Know almost nothing about my biological heritage. Okay. Now there's a few ways to look at this, I guess. I mean, for me, my thing is, okay, well, if you're adopted, don't know all your biological heritage test with ancestry, because then you can actually, then you have the best options of, you know, uploading the other websites, getting the most DNA matches you possibly can. And then you can build your actual tree by figuring out your matches, assuming that you can actually do it. Cause not everyone's going to be able to, even with a professional's help, it, you just don't have the matches. You don't. But in terms of the actual ethnicity estimates, I think, you know, the best answer for that would be if you really want a really nuanced one that claims to be one of the best, it would probably be living DNA because they give the biggest breakdown, the most subregions in the breakdown. So living DNA might be the best one. But then beyond that, I really don't have an answer for something like that. Like these are, these are the questions that are just kind of like, yeah, I mean... I understand as an adoptee, you kind of want to get an idea of, you know, how much of everything am I? But once again, it's kind of that same thing of there's so much more potential in everything else the DNA test offers with your matches and those tools that you can actually learn the real story and not just a very vague picture. Because that, that's another way to think of the ethnicity admixture is it's, it's like an extremely pixelated picture of your ancestry. And if your ancestry was a mate, you know, like a big in-depth painting and you only had a very pixelated version of it, you know, you might see just like a little pixelated, some sort of color. And, you know, you can't tell is that, you know, in the picture, is that a tree? Is that a chair? Is that a dog? Is that a person? Is that something completely different? And so it's kind of the same thing where it's like, you know, you look at your ethnicity admixture and it gives you these readings, but it could be all of these different things and it's just too pixelated to tell. So let's see. You can hear the little tap, tap, tap of their little feet. It has no business. Yeah, I know. Those two are so cute. And they actually just got groomed yesterday. So they're all nice and groomed. Jack, what about you? You want to say hi to my stream? Come here, baby boy. Come here. <laughs> Come here. Come on. What's this? What's this right here? What is it? What is it? Oh, look at you. Oh, who wants to say hi? Who wants to say hi? Oh, we got doggies. Oh, look at this guy. Oh, he's a little boy. Look at this little dog, everybody. So this is one of the dogs that makes it very hard for me to be able to put out videos as much as I'd like to. <laughs> this is Jack. And as you can tell, they are just very, very big little babies. <laughs> they love to be held like little babies. Don't you, baby boy? Little dog. All right. <laughs> uh, what about you, Petey? You want to say hi? No, you want me to kick the ball, don't you? All right. No, you don't want me to? Pupper. All right, come here. Come here, Petey. Come on. Come on. You say hi now. It's your turn. Oh, and this is Petey. This is his brother. Once again, they love to be held like little babies because they are my little babies. So, <laughs> well, little Bubba Duke, what do you think? You want to say hi to stream? Look at everybody. Look at them. <laughs> well, you're tired. All right. You're going back down too, Bubba. There you go. Yeah, my little boys. So actually, I've done doggy DNA for them. So if you go to the main channel, I did a DNA test for them through Embark. Oh, you guys went to your beds. Okay. I did a DNA test for them through Embark, and that's how I proved that they were brothers because they were rescues. They're found on the side of the road together at an estimated four months old. It was assumed they were brothers, 
but they obviously, as you all saw, they look kind of different. One looks much more Bichon. The other one looks kind of more like a wiener dog almost. Um, but they're actually, they're a mix of mini miniature poodle, Bichon, Pekingese, and uh, Chihuahua. And actually Chihuahua is like, poodle and Chihuahua were their number two highest percentages in their admixtures. But then we found that they had another full brother, which I, that was after I had already done my video. But so like, I know they're full brothers and then they have another full brother who's definitely from the same litter and he looks just like my PD. So yeah, definitely. Oh uh, yeah. The dog DNA. Thank you, Charlie. Charlie, Charlie's on it for me. Which speaking of which serious, serious shout out to Charlie and Matt who have been super helpful in running everything and, you know, I, I feel so lucky to be able to have, like, found from my audience some people that have been just so absolutely helpful um, and, you know, willing to volunteer their time. And, um, you know, we did have uh, we did have Mattias for a while as well, who I am extremely grateful for all the time that he gave for us as well. But he decided that he was going to kind of bow out uh, for, I, I guess, a bit or a while or undefined amount of time if he'll ever come back. I don't know. But still a very good friend of the channel. So, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Let's mark this one as answered. Blah, 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 blah. It's like now that I'm back to the old one, I have to remember how to. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's. <laughs> my mom is watching the stream and she just texted me over two hours now. I'm like, yeah, yeah. A little bit over two hours, but Hey, what can I say? I'm having fun. I'm having fun. Hopefully all you are too. I'm assuming. So I've actually been keeping a pretty steady, uh, steady number uh, about in the sixties and seventies for viewers. So for, this is, uh, this is, I, I'm quite happy at how well this is going. So hopefully this has been a lot of fun for all of you too. Um, Ooh, this, this is a good question. Should I test my daughter in order to take a deeper look into my own heritage? You know, let's, let's make this really easy for everyone to read. Everyone that has trouble reading just probably just cheered me on for doing that. <laughs> Oh, we have Magnus on from Sweden. Hello, Magnus. One of the people I see uh, comments uh, uh, in the in the in the comments a lot and in a lot of genealogy spaces. So, all right, to the question. Hi, does it make sense to test my daughter in order to take a deeper look into my heritage? Is it possible that my daughter inherited genes or ethnicities from my side, which I did not inherit? Since my wife is Egyptian and I am German, the DNA which my daughter inherited from her should be quite different from my own DNA. However, my wife has absolutely no interest whatsoever in genealogy. I'm also interested in my own genealogy. And then edit. I am also very interested in the DNA matches. Could it also be that my daughter gets DNA matches from my side, which I have not got? I know from family documents that one of my great-grandfathers was born in Russia to a Russian father in Germany. Russian mother, although knowing the name of the parents' birthday. Okay. And I'm not going to read the rest. I'm just going to jump to the answer. And the answer is your daughter is not going to get any DNA that you do not already have and your wife does not already have. The D It's not like DNA just kind of skips a generation. It's got to be passed down to you to then be passed down to your daughter. So it's, you know, it, it it's not necessarily going to be helpful, but... There is technically a way where sometimes children testing can be helpful for a parent. And that has to do with if you are trying to decipher your matches from one side to the other, and you're having a hard time splitting up your parents, you know, the matches from your mom's side and the matches from your dad's side. If you can get multiple of your children to do a DNA test, you can have them do a visual phasing and then by them visual phasing, they can then decipher their matches to fit whether it's your maternal side or their or your paternal side. It's not quite as strong as doing your own visual phasing sort of thing, but it's just something that can decipher things a bit further down if you really need to do that. Um, 
trying to, I feel like they said, did they say something about an adoption? Or no, I'm just, I'm thinking of the last question. So yeah, so most mostly the answer is no, there's not really going to be a help at all. Um, okay, did test. So, so we're going to call that one month <laughs> answered. <laughs> Review. Save. Okay. Leslie, cute dog. So fun to have tested their DNA. I tested both my dogs with wisdom. That's who I did their first test with. Uh, Shaperki and a Saluki. I'm sure I'm pronouncing those those wrong. Border collie mix, complete opposites. So I actually did a I did a test with wisdom first, which was actually through their. I, I got them. Uh, Banfield memberships to the Banfield hospitals. And part of that comes with a wisdom membership. And then I also ordered Embark. And the reason I ordered Embark was because at that time, wisdom did not have the relatives option and Embark did. Now Embark has it too. And then I think Ancestry has all of that available. All right. All right. So I think I'm going to answer one more question. And then I might chat a little bit and then I'll probably be finished wrapping up the stream uh, soon because I am already going a little bit longer than I expected. Um, all right. Jewish ancestry maternal. We can always do Jewish. All right. Hi, I did a my heritage DNA test. I'm a mixed heritage person. I've been told through my life that my maternal grandmother's maternal line is Jewish way back. I know one can't totally rely on DNA for proof of Jewishness, but it showed nothing of any Jewish DNA tests or showed nothing of any Jewish DNA on a test. My dad's mother was also Jewish, and that didn't show up, although I'm aware dads don't pass on their mtDNA. I just sent off for an mtDNA test from Family Tree DNA. I'm nervous, and I pray I get something from it as an, I'm an observant Jew and need some clarity. Can you please share your expertise on this, please? Thanks, Emil. So they did a MyHeritage DNA test, which is going to be all of their DNA. But then there's a few things they say that are a little confusing to me. Um, so I know, let's see, through my life, my maternal, grand, maternal line is way back. So maternal grandmother's maternal line. So further back than your great grandmother, probably, and probably even your second great grandmother. So the third great grandmother, you're going to be sharing, you know, small percentages, assuming they were 100% Jewish. But then dad's mother was also Jewish and that didn't show up. So your dad's mom was supposedly ethnically Jewish. Now, not religiously Jewish, ethnically Jewish, which I know this is a big confusion for a lot of people because I get comments all the time of, how can Judaism be be defined in the DNA? Because that's a religion, not an ethnicity. And am I going to convert to Judaism? And all of a sudden my DNA converts too. And no, it's an ethno-religion. So that means that it's a ethnicity that is also bound up within a religion. So there's technically two of the same thing. And when I was really first starting to get big into genealogy, um, before I even thought of doing professional stuff. I was actually writing blogs and one of the blog articles I wrote was about this and how in my mind, I always kind of thought of it as, you know, there's the Jewish religion and then the Jewish people, which it, you know, if only there was a term we could use other than Jewish, because then that would help kind of make it make more sense for a lot of people. So I said, you know, think of it like Israelite, which I don't know, nowadays with everything going on in the world, you know, saying all this stuff, who knows how people interpret what I'm saying. But the main thing really just being that there is an ethnicity of people who are Jewish. And if you're expecting to get DNA from your father's mother and you're expecting her to have been almost 100% Jewish, you'd be expecting about 25% Jewish DNA but most especially you'd be expecting a big portion, at least over 20%, most like, for, you know, for most grandparents, you're definitely going to be getting more than 20%. And, you know, it's, it, it, to me, it's saying that there's something else going on here. So, you know, was your mom ethnically Jewish or was she 
did she convert? That's a big question. And then if she didn't, are you matching the cousins from her family tree? Because now you're you're possibly dealing with an NP where maybe she isn't truly the daughter of who you thought she was the daughter of. And if that's the case, you will not match the DNA matches from those sides of the family because if you're not related to them, they just won't show up. So you'll need to know cousins who have already tested and, you know, having your mom do a DNA test too. I think you said you were going to have her, oh, wait, no, this is your dad's mother. Wait, no. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like all the way around your maternal grandmother's line was the maternal. Yeah. But your dad's mother. So if you can get your dad to do a DNA test, see, you know, see what it shows up for him, but most especially looking into those matches. So hopefully, hopefully that provides a little bit of clarity. Let's see, uh, let's see what some people say. Maternal haplogroup is hard to uh, is hard due to how rare it is to mutate. Yeah, it, it, maternal haplogroup is much less useful than a Y chromosome haplogroup, but it still is can be useful and genealogically relevant. A um, couple of quick notes: there are different groups of Jewish people around the world. Not all of them may belong to. A specific mitochondrial DNA haplogroup, very true. Uh, in regard to your paternal grandmother, you can have your father or another person who did inherit her mtDNA do a test that's available to you. Although with the paternal grandmother, it sounded like they're not saying that it's, you know, mitochondrial DNA they expect. It sounds more like they're saying they expect their maternal or their paternal grandmother to be 100% Jewish. Oh, what did I just click? <laughs> accidentally messing this up um and then three depending on the company you tested with they may not be able to identify the specific group of jewish group the uh, group of jewish group your ancestors were with could get eastern european for ashkenazi and north african for i don't have any experience with you yeah so what they're saying is kind of a, a presumption based on a lot of things that you do expect generally in DNA, which is, you know, you might not get one thing. You might get a group that is very close to them, either in geography or in relatedness. So like they're saying here, Eastern European for Ashkenazi, because Ashkenazim were heavily in Eastern Europe and then North African or Iberian for Sephardi, because that's where a lot of Sephardim were. But with Jewish DNA, it's not quite, I find that it's not quite as common um, with my heritage, you kind of, if you're Jewish, you get like a crazy sort of, <laughs> sort of reading sometimes. Um, but yeah. All right. I think that's uh that's a good last question. Um, let me make sure I mark this one as reviewed. Um, I'm still going to chat for just a minute. We're not going to end it just yet. Save. So... Yeah, let me go through everything. So, yeah, reasons why I'd love my brother to test. I'd love to see if he inherited the Irish from our mom's side. He won't because of his computers. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the one thing. If you, you're you trying to get your family members to test, and they're just not willing to, you know, the best thing you can do is just give them the information you have, be realistic about it. You know, there are downsides to DNA testing. There are risks to DNA testing. There are risks to uploading your DNA. I mean, there's risks to going on to Facebook and creating a YouTube profile and doing all sorts of different things, but they're all very different risks and you need to understand what comes with that for sure. But there are some family members that they're going to have reasons of why they're not DNA testing and it might just be out there, you know, straight up conspiracy theories. I've definitely, I mean, I get a lot of conspiracy theory people commenting on the channel, asking questions that are so obvious, like just weird conspiracy theorist questions. Like they think they're being so sly and smart and just, it's just like, yeah, you obviously do not understand this stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming out. I really appreciate it. I mean, this is for, for my first big official stream i think this went really amazingly well um you know I'll close that you, you can all look at my pretty mug for the next <laughs> last bit of this um so let's see my grandmother's family thought her grandmother might have been jewish during the war this because of her dark features and facial features since her father was unknown and still is so 
But I know, I know, Rob, you've done a lot of, or I think you've done a lot of DNA testing. I know you, you, you are very into genealogy, so I imagine you've probably found something connected with it. Um, and then, oh, greetings from Ukraine. Nice to see Odessa on your background. Thanks for the stream. Yeah, of course, I have uh, eight. I think it's an 1881 map of Odessa. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, I have uh, ancestry that comes from Odessa. They came over in 1882. Uh, so 1881, this map was the last uh, the last year that they were in Odessa. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of family from Ukraine, um, not just Odessa. Uh, part, part of my dad's family is from Tolchin. Uh, Tolchin, I think some is the proper way to pronounce it, which is in Venetia Oblast. I also have a lot of family coming from areas around Kiev, uh, most especially Festov and Vassal Kiev. But yeah, a lot of a lot of Ukrainian ancestry for me. Obviously, Jewish Ukrainian. Um, oh, and Rob following up on his last. So whenever German soldiers came in the street, there's tension in the shop. Having done a DNA, I'm very sure there is no Jewish. Yeah, that. I mean, that's you know, there's always those stories and families that someone thinks something or something happens where. All of a sudden, it's like, yeah, you know, I'll tell the descendants and you get these stories that aren't true getting passed down or have a lot of questionability to it. Um, do you have any family from Mainz, Worms, or Spire? I don't, but one of my Dutch Ashkenazi lines does have the Worms surname, and a lot of the Ashkenazi Jews in Amsterdam would have surnames or things correlating to where they came from. But I, I, I haven't researched that line of my family really in depth. So I honestly don't know how verifiable that stuff is. It's basically, you know, finding other trees that have been built on that line. Um, but, you know, there's only so much of your family tree that you can spend time verifying, especially when you do this professionally. Um, my nephew's half Moldovan, so I wonder if he might have some Ukrainian ancestry. Certainly possible. Technically, I'm part Moldovan. My great grandmother's family came from Kishinev. Um, but then again, they came out, you know, all of my family immigrated out of Eastern Europe, out of the Pale of Settlements in the between 1881, technically 1882, and 1904. The last of my ancestors arrived in the US in 1904. Um, but I'd imagine with, you know, Moldova, especially depending on the areas of Moldova. Uh, so like as an example, one of the towns that my father's family is from is a town called Sokorani. And Sokorani is literally surrounded. It's in Ukraine, but it is surrounded by Moldova. Uh, let's see if I can pull this up, show everybody on Google Maps. Um, but this is this is where my my purely paternal line, my Y DNA, the last paternal ancestor, known ancestor of mine, supposedly is buried in this town. So this is the town in Ukraine that my purely paternal line is from. Yes, an enclave would be a better way. So you can see here's Ukraine, and then here's Moldova. But interestingly enough. This family of mine that came from this town always considered themselves as Romanian Jews. And there was also, this family had a big connection with Yash, which is down here. So, you know, north, south, almost of each other. Um, but you can kind of just see, you know, the craziness of, Europe, of Eastern Europe, where you've got Ukraine, Moldova, and then Romania. And there's all of this, you know, back and forth. So like anyone, especially from these areas, you know, Pretty much all of Moldova, I feel like there's that possibility of a Ukrainian connection. Um, let's see. Hello, Jared. I really enjoy and have learned a lot from your videos over the years. I was wondering your perspective on DNA communities versus ancestry results. So this is something I've mentioned a few times uh, in different videos, but I often feel a bit more confidence in the DNA communities than the ancestry results in some senses. Not always, it can vary, uh, but I've found often that if, you know, if you're getting a DNA community, um, even if it's not necessarily your ancestry connected to it, you can almost always find some family tree connection of maybe like, you know, a 
third great grandparent or fourth great grandparent who, you know, migrated somewhere or, you know, did some, or had a sibling or siblings that did. And then now you have a ton of family that are then living in those areas. And so you get something like that. So, um, it, it, but for both of them, it's one of those things that you have, you, it's going to be different. Sometimes maybe the communities aren't going to be as confident as the ancestry results and maybe the other way around as well. Um, so I, I, I research with the ethnicity admixtures so little, like the ethnicity admixtures in the communities are kind of a starting point for me. And then I'll refer back to it every now and again, depending if there might be a question, like if I find some sort of ancestry in the family tree that it's like, wait, they're getting this, then maybe I'll see it in the DNA. But otherwise it's kind of like you look at it, you get an idea of what's going on and then you just move on. Um, Then my ancestry DNA test indicated I was part of the Southern Quebecois settlers, but I have no French percentages, which I found super interesting. And I, it's not too surprising. I mean, I think that I've seen a lot of people with French Canadian ancestry where they're not really getting French, but also French is one of those ones that's very difficult to read um, just because of the difficulty of just Central and Northwestern Europe you know, because France kind of really hits on all of those parts, you know, looking at that map, you know, I mean, it is Western Europe, but at the same time, you know, it's so large and there's so many population migrations, South, North, West, East, that, you know, French, you just get a lot of craziness. And especially depending on where you're from, because I, you look at someone who's from uh, Eastern France near Germany in the Alsace-Lorraine area, that is going to be very different DNA, I'm sure, than if you're looking at someone down in southern France that, you know, is in like the Basque region or something, you know. So it's, yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to close that out. So, all right, we're, <laughs> I think I'm going to end this in uh, at 4.30 in a couple of minutes. That should be good. So I need to, I need to get used. There we go. I'm still getting used to the StreamYard stuff. I'm still getting used to this whole streaming thing. So uh, let's see. You are welcome. <laughs> All right, let's see. How is it that husband has 7% France, yet mom only has 2% and dad at 1%? They're definitely all family. It's probably it's the difficulty of reading the DNA. And it could be a multitude of things. It could be that, you know, there's always an estimated margin of error of 1% on these tests, but it's estimated. And so sometimes you might have people that they run the test and it's a 1.5% margin of error. Sometimes it might be 0.5%. So it can vary. But then on top of that, once you have your SNPs read, so that's the reading of the actual DNA, then you need to put those through the algorithm, which has its own errors and margin of error. So, you know, you're going to go first through the first margin of error, then you get the second part. And so with each step, you kind of get a bit more. And even with the margin of errors, even considering that, you know, maybe it's correct in a sense, what could also be happening is just a misreading of the DNA because it's unfazed. Um, granted, if mom has tested and dad has tested and assuming that the site they've all tested through is the same one and that site has phasing available, then it shouldn't be a problem. So like 23 and me, they, they had it. So that should definitely, you know, shouldn't be an issue necessarily, but there's a few different reasons why this could happen. It's not totally uncommon. And it could also just be that the, you know, 7% that your husband's getting is just including a lot of misreads going on which I guess I've already said that in a different way. So, yeah. Um, thanks for the stream. Hope everyone has liked it and subscribed. Thank you. I agree. If you have not liked or subscribed, be sure to do so. Uh, if you're on YouTube, be sure to go to my Facebook page and my Twitch and follow me there. Um, and yeah, just, just everywhere, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, follow all of my channels. And if you want to, uh, if you want to catch the random gaming streams, I'm going to have from time to time, go find my genie gaming channels, which, I've linked up in my in my main channel uh, or on both of my channels. If you go to my my the main page, 
and then look at um, the channels. I have it in there. So if you go under community, oh wait, no, it's not there. Where is it? Oh yeah, I guess it's under home. You've got to go all the way down to the bottom and then there's Genie Gaming, which you all can't see because I'm blocking it with it. Okay. There we go. <laughs> ah! There we go. So this is this is the gaming channel. So I did late night gaming last night. <laughs> Played Civilization V. So, but yes, thank you everybody so much for, for coming out to the stream today. I truly appreciate it. I'm trying to trying to read the last one. I got a lot of messages here kind of in the last uh, last little bit. Um yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Ooh, that's a big find. The twin sister, that's a big find. So, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I hate that. They've been, it's been going, all, some of it, it's been, sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not. And I, I, I don't know if they're editing it or not. And yeah, it's weird. So, but yeah. So, all right. Well, once again, thank you so much, everybody. If you have not liked or subscribed, be sure to do that. Go to all the channels, do that, share around, help me out. And uh, just once again, too, you know, if you do want to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with me, go to my Patreon and there are two tier options where you can either do a half hour session once a month or an hour session once a month. And then you get a lot of other perks with it too. So thank you so much, everybody. And you have a wonderful rest of your day or night, wherever you are in the world.